And so now, uh, what I'd like to do is to begin a series of talks on uh, Thomas Pynchon's great novel, Gravity's Rainbow. Uh, this is the edition that I'll be using here, the Viking Penguin Classics edition. And I'm also going to supplement it by reading uh, Stephen Weisenberger's commentary to Gravity's Rainbow, which is a very good commentary. I highly recommend it. Um, he doesn't get everything, but he does get a lot. Um, nobody can get everything out of Pynchon, just like nobody can get everything out of Joyce. And Pynchon, I think, is the American response to Joyce. I think that uh, Gravity's Rainbow has rightly been compared with Ulysses, and I would say that <clears throat> Gravity's Rainbow is the greatest novel after World War II, just as Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, and I think Finnegan's Wake really deserves the award. Uh, most people don't mention it because it's too hard for most people to read, uh, but I think Finnegan's Wake is the greatest novel of the first half of the 20th century, uh, rivaled closely by Ulysses, of course. Everyone jumps up and down about Ulysses because nobody wants to read Finnegan's Wake. It's too hard. Uh, but it is the better book, I think. It's, it's After all, Joyce spent 17 years writing <laughs> Finnegan's Wake, so there's a lot going on in there. Um, but in an interesting way, uh, I like to compare Gravity's Rainbow to Thomas Mann's novel. I think it's a 1924 novel, The Magic Mountain. The Magic Mountain is probably the greatest novel ever written about World War One, And it's written about World War One, but it, even though it's not set in World War One, but it's a, it's a beautiful discussion of the ideologies and philosophies uh, going into that war and, and what the basic arguments were uh, that, that led up to that war. And I think that Gravity's Rainbow is probably the greatest novel ever written about World War II. Um, it's set during the last nine months of World War II, from December down to August. It ends with the bombing of the uh, Japanese with the Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, so it goes down to that. And um, Pynchon himself uh, then comes out of the East Coast. Uh, he's a New Yorker. He went to Cornell, uh, where he took some classes, creative writing classes under uh, Nabokov, who claimed never to have remembered him. But Nabokov's wife says that she remembered his peculiar way of writing uh, as a mixture of printed letters with cursive letters. So that stood out in her mind. So his wife remembered him. Um, and then for a while after graduating from Cornell, he just wandered around, uh, wandered in Mexico, uh, found his way to California. And in 1960, 61, 62, we find him working uh, as an employee at Boeing in Seattle, where he wrote an article about how to uh, safely move uh, the Bomark missile, which is rather sarcastically titled Togetherness. And uh, that has his characteristic stamp of sarcasm, irony, and humor. Uh, I'm surprised they let him keep that title for such a serious article for a, for a, uh, a, a totally serious newsletter. Um, and then at that time, he was working on his first novel, V, his first short stories. He starts working on 1959, thereabouts. Um, the Small Rain is his first story, uh, which can be found in his short story collection, The Slow, uh, Slow Learner. And in a way, that, that story, uh, the, the Small Rain, prefigures the atmosphere of Gravity's Rainbow. It's about a character named uh, Ned Lardass Levine, who is a, a military uh, individual who has been called in to help clean up uh, a bunch of dead bodies that the, a hurricane has blown in through uh, off the Gulf, Gulf of uh, Mexico there and um, blown in, uh, destroyed all these people. And the character... Uh, in a way, prefigures uh, the character here, Tyrone Slothrop, is a very apathetic, uh, motivation, unmotivated, completely unmotivated individual uh, who is very affectless and uh, supposed, supposedly brilliant, but all he does is spend his time reading a trashy novel over and over again, and he never really does anything. And uh, the military atmosphere and the lack of uh, affect on the part of the main character, um, I think already sort of, in a way, uh, in, in, a, in a nuclear way, uh, already prefigures, like a seed, already prefigures uh, the atmosphere of Gravity's Rainbow, which is his third novel. So he wrote eight novels, uh, and the one short story collection, Slow Learner, and the eight novels are V, which he put out in 1963, which is surely one of the best first novels ever written. He won the William Faulkner Award for Best First Novel, justly so, I think. That is one of the best, and I'm, I'm hard-pressed to think of a first novel that's as good uh, unless maybe we count Proust's uh, Swan's Way. But um, first novels usually are not, uh, they're notoriously weaker uh, endeavors, um, but that is, that is a great work. One of my favorite novels, actually, 1963, V, 
And then we have 1966, the short novel, very brilliant, The Crying of Lot 49, and then um, 1973, Gravity's Rainbow, um, which he wrote while living in a small duplex on Manhattan Beach in California. And there was a chazora there for a while, and um, during which he only put out the short story collection, Slow Learner, and then didn't get back to putting out novels until Vineland in 1990. And then in 1997, he followed that with Mason and Dixon, which was followed, I think, in uh, 2006 by Against the Day, another great, brilliant work. And then uh, in, um, what is it, uh, let's see, 2011 for Inherent Vice, uh, 2009, rather, for Inherent Vice, and 2013 for Bleeding Edge. Um, I wasn't too impressed by Bleeding Edge, and I've seen, I haven't read the novel for Inherent Vice, but I've seen the film. Neither were terribly impressive. I think there's been a falling away of quality. I don't think he's written anything on the stature of Against the Day since that book, which probably is the only other novel that he wrote after this initial three books, this sort of trilogy that I like to think of them as, uh, as Against the Day, which is probably the only one that belongs in that group on that level of genius. Um, so that's Pynchon's uh, Irv in a nutshell as an overview. And now, so we have Gravity's Rainbow, <clears throat> which is his magnum opus. And um, I want to move into this. And it's broken into four parts. The first part is called Beyond the Zero. And the second part is called Umperm al Casino Gering. And the third part is called In the Zone. And the fourth part is called The Counterforce. Now, anytime you have a mandala of four parts, as with Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, uh, you can pretty much expect some sort of a cosmic world cycle to be involved here since uh, world cycles normally occur in fours, such as the Hindu theory of the, Kali, uh, of the yugas, which ends with the Kali Yuga. There are four yugas. Or with Hesiod's four world ages, uh, or Vika's four world ages, which, of course, Joyce models Finnegan's wake off of. And I think here, uh, each of these four sections is connected with one of the signs of the zodiac. And um, so Pynchon is dealing with a cosmic world age, and there's lots of cosmological Kiliastic and eschatological and apocalyptic themes in this novel. Pynchon is dealing with the big stuff, with big picture stuff here. Uh, but he is a postmodernist, and in that respect, I think we can say that uh, one of Pynchon's main preoccupations is the fact that he never lands entirely on one decisive set of meanings. He will develop an argument and make it into uh, an antinomy, whereby you can make just as good arguments for the one side as you can for the other, just like the famous Kantian antinomies about, let's say, you can make just as good an argument for the universe being infinite in space as you can for it being finite, or infinite in time as you can for it being finite in time. Um, those are antinomies, and uh, postmodernism is made out of this uncertainty of meaning regarding which you cannot land on one side or the other. Pynchon provides us with just as much evidence um, as in V, where the character Herbert Stencil is convinced that there has been a conspiracy regarding this woman V that he's been tracking and studying, and he's convinced that she's this mysterious, enigmatic figure. But as his name implies, a Stencil, uh, maybe he's just projecting patterns onto uh, history where no such patterns exist. So Pynchon always leaves room for the possibility that maybe there isn't a conspiracy. In uh, the Crane of Lot 49, the Tristero may exist or it may not exist. He never tells us. He just leaves it up to us to play around with. And so there's a lot of that here, too, in Gravity's Rainbow, um, that deferral of meaning, whereas somebody like Joyce is going to give you an absolute crystalline structure that's like a Gothic cathedral, Gothic cathedral that does have a very fixed set of meanings that you can assemble. And it's there, and it's what Joyce wanted, and he wants you to get it and figure it out. Um, it's like Hegel's idea of absolute objective truth. It's out there. The structure is there. He's providing you with the clues for you to assemble it, and it's all there. And once you get it, you get the award of being able to figure it out. Not so with Pynchon. There, there are, uh, it's always, meaning is always deferred in Pynchon to one side or the other of the antinomy. Um, <clears throat> so now Gravity's Rainbow is set. Uh, during the last nine months of World War II, World War II stretches from 1939 to 1945, uh, and it ends, uh, first we get the surrender of the, of the Nazis in the springtime there, uh, April, May of 1945, and then the Japanese fight for a while longer down to uh, August with the dropping of the, uh, the two atom bombs on them. And so Pynchon sets this during the last nine months, and of course nine months already indicates that there's a gestation process, it's an embryonic process, Something is coming into being out of this. 
Uh, and so we'll get into that. What is the embryo that is gestating here from these last nine months? And indeed, the first section beyond the zero takes place over nine days uh, in 21 segments or episodes, as Stephen Weisenberger calls them episodes instead of chapters. And in the first section, there are 21 of those. And he points out that in the tarot deck with the major arcana, there are 21 cards, if you discount the fool card, which is the zero. Um, so there are 21 cards there. And ultimately, there are 73 episodes in the entire book, which I find to be an interesting number because, uh, here again, 73 is a number that just misses the magical mythical number of 72, uh, which is the key number, and I'm sure Pynchon must have known this, uh, which is the key number for the precession of the equinoxes, which proceeds backwards one degree along the horizon every 72 years. And you find the 72 recurring over and over again throughout myth, such as when they capture uh, Osiris and put him in a coffin, and they drive 72 nails into the coffin because it's connected with the precession of the equinoxes. Um, so it's interesting because in the, in the modernist world, it would have turned out to be exactly 72, and we could have connected it with the precession, perhaps. Uh, but in the postmodernist world, it's 73, and so it just misses the meaning that we would like uh, for it to line up as, for it to satisfy our, our insistence on absolute meaning. Not so in the postmodern world. Everything gets disrupted with asymmetries, with uh, fuzzy meanings, with the unconcealing of entities in the Heideggerian clearing in a fuzzy way, where we never quite get all the facets of the entity. And for every time, according to Heidegger, and this is why Heidegger is the grandfather of postmodernism, every time an entity unconceals itself in the clearing, it does so imperfectly, and we only see certain facets of it. And if we change the question that we put to the entity, certain facets of it, are also unconcealed, and then other facets fall into the darkness of the clearing. Uh, so we never get a full picture. Same thing here with pension. So Beyond the Zero then takes place over uh, nine days, starting with December 18th, uh, as the opening episode gives us December 18th, um, down through nine days, um, and it's called, uh, the part one is called Beyond the Zero, and Beyond the Zero refers to a number of things. Um, the zero refers on the one hand, to Pavlovian uh, classical conditioning, where the zero point is reached where there's a complete lack of response in whatever the dog is that, you're, that salivates when you ring the bell, and then finally, finally you reach a point where the conditioning has reached a zero and you can't go any further than that. There's no response to the stimulus. And so it indicates the affectlessness of uh, stimuli. But it's beyond the zero, Pynchon is saying. So... And beyond the zero, to the other side of zero, of course, are the negative numbers. And the negative numbers almost imply um, a completion of the, uh, the parabolic arc, which is then completed with the circle that's hidden under the earth that Pynchon suggests here. Now, this leads us into the, the title, Gravity's Rainbow. And the book was originally called Mindless Pleasures. Thank God he didn't put it out with that title. Uh, but it's called Gravity's Rainbow. And the gravity... The rainbow that, is, that this refers to is the parabolic arc that is made by the launch of a V-2 missile. And the novel's central fetish is, of course, the V-2 missile, just as Moby Dick's central fetish is the great whale, or uh, Ulysses' uh, central fetish is the city of Dublin. Here it's v, the V-2 rocket. Um, and um, so the rainbow, then, is the, the contrail that is made across the sky as the rocket launches, and all the rockets here are launched from The Hague in Holland, where the Nazis parked it, uh, the mobile launching pad there, and started shoot, pummeling London with rockets, starting with September. September 8th was the first V-2 rocket to land in London. It only killed three people at that time, but it was terrifying. Um, <clears throat> so the rocket creates a contrail that goes across the sky, and when the sunlight shines through it, supposedly, at least in theory, it creates a kind of rainbow image. Uh, but if you stand, according to, according to Steven Weisenberger here, if you stand at a certain angle in an ideal sense, the rainbow might, instead of being parabolic, would be experienced as a circle. But the bottom part of that para parabola is buried under the earth, like the hidden numbers beyond the zero. The negative numbers beyond the zero are also under the earth. But it's also interesting because... Gravity suggests, um, as in Ulysses, which is a central motif in Ulysses, that gravity uh, is the number, uh, gravity is that which falls. All falling bodies fall at the same constant rate of acceleration, 30, 32 feet per second, and that's the fall. But with Joyce, you get the redemption as well as the fall. 
Uh, and here the redemption is the rainbow because in the Old Testament, after God wipes man out with the flood, he sends a rainbow which is meant to indicate his covenant and renewal. That he will never do this to humanity again so long as they keep the covenant with him. Uh, but it suggests renewal. So gravity's rainbow uh, suggests both fall and rise, redemption, but it also suggests the two kinds of cycles of history with that image of the parabolic arc uh, having its completion as a sort of optical image with the sunlight shining through the parabola and completing it, the idea of the two different models of history, the, the circular model of history that we've inherited uh, from Hesiod with the four different world ages, the age of gods, the age of heroes, the age of men, and then uh, the age of complete decadence, the Iron Age. Um, that's a circular model of history, and Gene Gebser talks about this in The Ever-Present Origin, where he talks about the mythical consciousness structure um, is always based on the eternal return. Everything is cyclical. Everything comes back again full season, just like the seasons do that model the year. Um, so we always get four world ages, um, just like the four seasons, uh, although the Greeks only had three seasons, so in some, case, some cases it's divided into three seasons. Uh, but then with the rainbow as the parabolic arc, we get the Judeo-Christian Islamic vision of history for the first time that is no longer cyclical. Everything has not already happened before. Everything is a unique singularity. So we get a beginning of history, a middle, and an ending. We get a genesis, a crucifixion, an apocalypse. Uh, so we get a definite beginning, middle, and ending, a three-act drama that suggests a parabolic arch that is brought in then by uh, what, Gebser calls the mental consciousness structure, which she sees everything in, in terms of threes, like the Hegelian dialectic of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Everything occurs in threes in this mental consciousness structure. So which is it? So Pynchon is going to Pynchon is going to play with these two different models of history: the the arc, the eternal return, with all the references that he has to the zodiac, which does apply the arc of eternal return. But the arc of apocalypticism, and there's lots of apocalyptic imagery in this. Uh, he maps on the liturgical, the Catholic liturgical calendar onto all of this, which is based on the singularity and uniqueness of these world events. Um, the uh, the novel begins during the Advent season, which is the fourth uh, Sunday before Christmas. Um, Advent is concerned with Advent is the Latin translation of the Greek word parousia, Adventus, and the parousia refers to the second coming of Christ at the end of history which is already part of what Advent, leaning up to Christmas, is all about, is anticipating and making ready for the second coming of Christ. So he sets it during the Advent season, uh, starting with December 18th, for a reason. So the Advent season, singularity, historical uniqueness, but December 18th is, astrologically, we're in the sign of Sagittarius. Sagittarius, the last three days of Sagittarius, which ends on December 21st, when it shifts into Capricorn, uh, and Sagittarius is interesting that the novel begins under the sign of Sagittarius because Sagittarius is, of course, the archer, the one who fires the missile up into the heavens, which is the ancient mythological prototype for the V-2 rocket. And in many ways, the V-2 rocket is simply a mechanized version of the ancient thunderbolt hurled by Indo-Aryan sky gods like Thor and Zeus, uh, Zeus Jupiter, uh, and Yahweh, uh, Indra in the Hindu tradition, these are all thunderbolt-wielding sky gods. Votan has a spear, uh, Thor has the hammer, Mjolnir, but they're both associated. Uh, Thor's hammer is associated with the thunderbolt, but uh, supposedly I think Votan's spear is associated with rays of the sun. But nonetheless, uh, I think the semionics of the, the V-2 rocket as a mechanized uh, spear or is meant to represent a mechanization of the thunderbolt. Um, and uh, so, and that goes all the way back, of course, to the Paleolithic tradition, where you have in the Paleolithic the invention of the world's first spears and the Atlatls during the Magdalenian epoch around 14,000 BC uh, that launched them, like the mobile launch pad that the Nazis move around to launch the V2 rocket. Now, the V2 rocket then, for some context on that, um, <clears throat> was invented uh, basically and designed by Werner von Braun. And the opening uh, quote of the book here is from him. He is the patron saint, as it were, of the space age, since he's the one who uh, helped the Nazis design the world's first rockets. The Allies did not have them. Um, <clears throat> and there's an opening quote here from Werner von Braun, where it says, uh, Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. 
Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. And so the context, and Weissenberger provides this in his commentary, the context that this comes from is a discussion of Werner von Braun's belief in the immortality of the soul. He doesn't believe that the soul can just disappear since nothing in nature disappears. Even the tiniest molecule or particle has to be accounted for. Nothing completely ever for him falls off the radar. And so he believes that the human soul must exist and that um, the technology of the rocket is somehow in a weird way connected with all of these eschatological ideas about the end of time and the realization of the last judgment. And this passage is preceded by Benjamin Franklin, one of the first sort of aerial scientists with this kite in the sky being struck by the thunderbolt, lightning, uh, with a little quote by Benjamin Franklin talking about how, uh, talking about the last judgment and how uh, the soul will be judged there and that it's an absolute certainty. So there's a hidden reference to the apocalypse in this quote from von Braun since Franklin's epigraph uh, comes from this piece. Now, Werner von Braun, um, as the, the architect of the space age, um, was a German and became a Nazi, of course. He was put in charge at the age of 25 uh, of the missile program. And the missiles, by the way, uh, they're called V, V1, V2, uh, which means Fahrgeltungswaffe, and which means revenge weapons. And these were promised by Hitler after the firebombings, after the Allies began the firebombings, especially the firebombing of Lübeck, which was the first main firebombing, which they did in 1942. And uh, Hitler promised retaliation weapons for that firebombing. And then later, of course, they got worse and worse. In 1944, with the firebombings of Hamburg and the firebombings of Dresden, they just kept getting worse and worse. And so Hitler promised these revenge weapons, and so that's what the V in V1 and V2 represent. Why V2? Because the V1 rocket um, was created first, and it was launched. And actually, all of this took place on the Baltic Sea on a peninsula that's, that's called uh, the island of uh, Usedom. And uh, Paine Amunda is the research facility uh, on the western side of the island, which was taken over by the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, who perfected the V-1, what's called a buzz bomb. And on the eastern side of the island, the V-2 was perfected by uh, von Braun's research team connected with the Army. And um, so the V-1 bomb uh, got off the ground first, and the V-1 bomb, uh, in contradistinction to the V-2 bomb, uh, the V-1 missile uh, was still uh, horizontal. It's still basically modeled after the airplane. It's powered by a jet engine. Uh, for the first time. The Nazis invent the jet engine, and it's powered by the jet engine, but it has wings, uh, and it's a pilotless, uh, pilotless aircraft uh, that's launched at a 45-degree angle. Uh, they weren't terribly effective, and the Nazis started launching them, I believe, in June of 1944, but the V-2 rocket, on the other hand, uh, is launched vertically, directly upright. Uh, it has no wings. Instead, it has tail fins, and it goes straight up and it can go about 50 miles up, so it can, it can touch the bottom of the stratosphere. It can go about 50 miles up and had a range of about 250 miles, which was enough for it to get over to London. And the reason they had to do this was because the, the Nazis just never quite got up the courage to launch an offensive across uh, the English Channel, which, as John Mearsheimer has said uh, in his book about power politics, uh, there's something about the stopping power of water there, especially with that channel, that has made it very difficult for England to be invaded throughout history uh, because of the di difficulties of crossing that channel. You really have to have complete mastery over your navy in order to do that successfully. And the Nazis, I think, uh, to the end, remained trepidatious about making the crossing to invade London. And so, in a way, um, this was their response to that, was to, to pummel London with these uh, V-2 missiles which they sent uh, something like 1,500 of them over about seven months from September down to March, uh, something like 1,500 of them. They weren't very effective. They only killed about something like 3,000 people over that period. It had no appreciable, uh, made no appreciable difference on the outcome of the war whatsoever. And so it really only was a, a weapon of terror that just terrorized people. And so uh, this is the thing about the, so the V1, V2, uh, the invention of the space age is coming into being here, as Walter Dornberger uh, said to uh, uh, von Braun one day when the, they did the first test launch of the V-2 rocket. And it was a successful test launch. And uh, he said, we've just invented the spaceship today. And indeed, the birth of the space age does come into being there. And von Braun grew up, he read as a, as a young kid uh, 
uh, Herman Obert's book, uh, The Rocket into Interplanetary Space, in 19, came out in 1923, which was the German uh, invention of rocketry, although the Russians had been there first with Sapkowski, who in the 1880s uh, had begun already talking about and theorizing about the, uh, the possibility of space travel using rockets. And these two guys were both theoreticians. But in America, we produced an individual named Robert Goddard, who wasn't just a theoretician, but he was an engineer who, in the 1920s and 30s in Massachusetts, and then he later he moved to near Roswell, New Mexico, uh, started actually building these rockets and launching them and experimenting with launching small, small rockets. Uh, and he was getting the space age going there in America, but uh, the Americans never really picked it up until they won the war and captured von Braun and brought him over to the southwest, uh, and uh, which is much more congenial to von Braun anyway, because the whole reason that he got involved with the rocket science program wasn't to pummel the Allies. It was because he, he knew that this was the key to leaving the Earth and beginning his dream. He grew up on reading the science fiction novels of Verne and Wells, as all these guys did. Uh, of realizing his dream of, of interplanetary space travel, of leaving the Earth and, and traveling into the stars. He was a romantic, von Braun was, and he was convinced this was the way to do it. Um, and so he had a hard time actually being incorporated into a Nazi sort of death regime where his talents were being used like Wieland the Smith, which is basically what he was here, the, the modern incarnation of the German Scandinavian uh, hero Wieland the Smith, who's the one who always has to, like Daedalus in Greek myth, always has to supply the king with his weapons of war, uh, which is how he makes his bread and butter, but he's really fascinated simply with inventing gadgets and making cool things happen. And von Braun was essentially a, a, a Wieland the Smith guy here for the Nazis. He got in trouble with them again and again, but they knew he, they couldn't get that space pro, uh, the, uh, the missile program off the ground without him. He was only 25 years old, and he was put in charge of the whole rocket program at Painamunda <coughs> on this island. <coughs> and... Um, he, got it, he did indeed get it going for them and got it off the ground. So that's Werner von Braun, and he's the chief architect. In a way, the space age would never have happened without him uh, and without these missiles that led into, of course, the, the American uh, Gemini launches and the Apollo space program and all that came out of this. So then we have this first episode, which I think is, is quite good. Uh, it's one of the greatest opening chapters. It's deceptively simple. It took me a few readings uh, to, to get the, the genius of it here. Um, so, Pynchon doesn't title his episodes, and this one's only, uh, what is it, uh, four, five, six pages long. Uh, and it opens up with a, a dream that is being had by an individual named Jeffrey Pyrus, uh, Pirate Prentice. And he's named, nicknamed Pirate Prentice after a character in Gilbert and Sullivan's uh, opera, The Pirates of Penzance. Um, so, he's named after this character, and he's a special ops guy. He's working for the British uh, Special Ops. Uh, this is, it opens up, he's set in London. He's asleep and dreaming. Uh, so this is the equivalent of what later becomes the American OSS that later evolves into the CIA. So he's one of these guys, and his job usually is to be parachuted into a territory and find out information, uh, especially into Germany, to find out information about the, the, uh, the V-2 rocket program, um, which the Allies were very worried about. Even though they weren't terribly effective, they were very worried about it. And so... Um, He's here dreaming, and his dream begins with one of the most famous opening lines of all novels in history, a screaming comes across the sky. Okay, so a screaming comes across the sky, and the first thing to note about that, this is the sound that the rocket is making inside his dream that the rocket is making, um, and it's the sky. It draws your attention to the sky, uh, which, of course, um, as Paul Virilio wrote in all, almost all of his books about how um, the history of the tactical strategies on the battlefield after World War II uh, gradually shifted into the orbit, the orbital spaces around the planet. Uh, the space program, of course, leads to uh, the sequel to von Braun. The next genius to come on stage is, of course, Howard Hughes, who uh, inaugurates the full-blown space program with his ATF satellites, his geosynchronous satellites that he puts into orbit around the Earth that enable global planetary communications for the first time ever in history. And so this is the whole thing, is the shift to the sky now is the key that happens after World War II, the shift into aerial space. Um, the uh, Virilio talks about in his book Desert Screen about how the Iraq War uh, could not have been won without the, the satellites in orbit. Everything was beaming information between these satellites, uh, and the hapless Iraqis just couldn't, uh, couldn't keep up with that. But now the screaming 
you hear the screaming, but then it says on the next line, but it's too late. Because the thing about the V-2 rocket is that it was the first ballistic missile to break the sound barrier. It was the first one to go uh, faster than the speed of sound. And so the thing about that is that you wouldn't hear the missile coming in. If you were in London going about your business, there would simply come the explosion, and then you'd hear the sound because the rocket went faster than the speed of sound. Now, the significance of that is that it actually inverts the relationship between cause and effect. You should have the cause, uh, you should hear the sound, uh, as not exactly a cause, but in connection, nonetheless, with the rocket crashing and landing as effect. And this idea of the inversion of cause and effect is going to be one of the novel's main themes, one of its main philosophical uh, dialogic discussions as the novel goes along is this inversion of cause and effect. Um, so it's too late. The evacuation still proceeds. And after the first V-2 rocket landed on September 8th in 1944, it only killed three people, but um, a major evacuation of about a million and a half people had to proceed as a result. But now we get this image that um, all of these people are being evacuated and they're stuffed into this conveyance, this vehicle, and they're driving through this decimated landscape that's obviously been hit by other V-2 missiles before. And it's a very apocalyptic image. And the language is rendered in such a way that it sounds very much like Pynchon is making references to the Last Judgment. And indeed, um, <clears throat> as it says here, the um, total blackout, uh, and uh, they won't, they're won't. they worried about being saved. And the imagery is, it, it, for these first two and a half pages, it very much is Thomas Pynchon's dialogue with the medieval motif or late medieval motif of the Last Judgment, which was popular uh, in Europe around 1500. We get uh, Grunewald's Last Judgments, uh, Van Eyck's, Jan Van Eyck's Last Judgments. And this is basically the image that he gives us here, um, where everyone is just disheveled, slovenly, falling apart. Uh, they're disoriented. They don't know exactly where they're being herded off to. And they travel, they travel through this conveyance, and they're dumped off in front of this building that's just a hollow, empty shell. And Pynchon makes reference here to uh, a collapsed crystal palace, uh, which is a reference, of course, to Joseph Paxton's crystal palace that was built in London as part of the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was basically a Sloterdijk. Peter Sloterdijk puts it in his book, In the World Interior of Capital, the world interior of capital uh, during that age. It swallowed up the French arcades and began to sprout department stores on the inside of it. And here, I think World War II was really the ending of that world interior, the Crystal Palace as the global iron and glass enclosure that enclosed everyone inside of it and gave everyone their desires in realizing the dreamlike world, as Benjamin talks about in the Arcades Project, the dreamlike world of capital and capitalism inside that Crystal Palace. Um, that's what's being dismantled and collapsed by World War II. Uh, the sequel to that is the postmodern world interior of the shopping mall proper, Victor Gruen's bi-level indoor air-conditioned shopping mall, the first of which appears in Edina, Minnesota in 1956, is the sequel to the Crystal Palace that the war disintegrated. Um, but they're all being herded off, these disheveled individuals, um, and they're gradually pushed into this weird, a very Kafkaesque building. It reminds me of something out of like Orson Welles' film uh, version of The Trial, Everything is disintegrating, going down these hallways. And it's a very nightmarish Last Judgment scenario. And it finally begins to dawn on them that they're not among the elect. They're amongst the preterite, uh, what is called the, the damned, not the saved. And a slow realization begins to dawn on them that they're, they're being filed off to the right hand. Uh, in the imagery of the Last Judgment, you have the Archangel Michael standing with a pair of scales. Uh, and the scales tilt one way. Uh, and the devil's trying to tilt them in his favor, but the way that they tilt is the way that, uh, leaning to the right, that the the, the elect will be saved. They're, they file off to the right, and the damned who will not be saved file off to the left. The left is always the sinister direction. It's always associated with death, so they file off to the left. And then we get a similar in, uh, image here as a kind of uh, apocalyptic thermodynamic engine of the separation of hot from cold that powers the engine of the apocalypse here. But then the dream ends, and the person having the dream is Pirate Prentice, the special ops guy. He wakes up. He's inside of a what's called a maisonette, uh, a crumbling uh, structure, and uh, he begins to notice that the guy sleeping on the balustrade just above him, somebody's kicked out the, balustra the balusters from it, 
and in his sleep, he's roll, slowly rolling over, and he manages to catch it just in time, slips out from under him, kicks his cot under him, and this guy who's named Teddy Bloat falls comically right onto the cot. It captures him perfectly, and he goes back to sleep rather comically. Uh, and that's the beginnings now of the of, of pensions motif of vaudeville. Um, the thing about Gravity's Rainbow is that it's a, it's a very highly comic novel. Pynchon has a tremendous sense of humor, and it's filled with all these uh, apocalyptic images that are constantly undercut by uh, his vaudeville shenanigans. And so this guy is wandering around, and um, he goes up a, a spiral staircase to the roof in echo of the opening chapter of Ulysses, with Buck Mulligan ascending up the gun tower to the roof where he performs a fake mass based on shaving. In this case, Pirate Prentice goes up to the roof, uh, and the sun hasn't risen yet. And he's just up on the roof, and he's yawning and trying to wake up. Uh, he's been uh, herding bananas, or he's got some banana clippings that are put into a hothouse, and he's been making everybody banana breakfasts every morning. Uh, and so he's up there yawning, and he looks off to the east, and he just happens to see a glint of light off to the east. And he thinks, hmm, what is that? That's funny. It looks kind of like a star. Um, and Pynchon here, of course, wants you to think of the star of Bethlehem, uh, the star of Bethlehem that drew in the book of Matthew, that drew the three magi in quest of uh, the Savior, the incarnation of the Savior. Um, here, of course, we have a man-made star. It's one of the V-2 rockets being launched from The Hague uh, before dawn by the Nazis. They take about five minutes to arrive across the water. And... Um, this, this is the end of history now. This isn't the inauguration of a savior. This is an instrument of total apocalyptic destruction now, a Vergangsungsfaffa that is headed their way. And so it's an artificial star. And it, tra it traces the contrail across the sky that becomes a gravity's rainbow as Prentice begins to think about the possibility of sunlight shining through it and how it would create a kind of prism that would create an aura made out of a kind of rainbow-type structure. And the thing keeps coming and pretty soon it begins to dawn on him, it must be one of those rockets that he's heard about. He hasn't seen one yet, but he's heard about them. This must be one of the V-2 rockets. Now, the comedy here is that this is a special ops guy, all right? He would know all about this. And his response is totally uh, at absolute zero in the Pavlovian scheme of things. He's totally apathetic. And he stands there scratching himself, trying to figure out what he should do. And he's like, oh, the rocket's going to get here, and he's not sure where it could land anywhere, uh, and he doesn't know what to do, and he says, I'll pick some bananas, uh, rather comically. Uh, so his response is just to go into the hothouse where he's been herding bananas, uh, and of course, Pynchon Pin Pin wants you to think of you know the comic routine of slipping on a banana peel and all that kind of comic things, and he goes into the hothouse, and, and he puts a load of bananas into his, sh uh, his dressing robe, loads them up, He's yawning, and he walks back out onto the rooftop. Meanwhile, the rocket is still approaching, uh, and he goes down into the, the place where he sets out the bananas, and he starts distributing them, wondering what, what's going to happen next, which is wonderful because um, the whole chapter, and it's very short, but it, it, it compresses Pynchon's whole uh, chiliastic apocalypticism, which is very deadly serious. Um, he sees World War II as a kind of apocalypse. Uh, on the one hand, but on the other, he always undercuts it by bringing in vaudevillian slapstick, uh, people slipping on things, and later there will be a chapter about the, the famous candy chapter about people endlessly eating candy, and all this kind of wonderful sense of humor. I think it's a very funny chapter. So uh, anyways, we'll leave it there uh, with the chapter one of Gravity's Rainbow.